Let's get right into it. Number 10. The Tongue's Taste Map For over a century, we believe that different parts of your tongue were responsible for different tastes. You've seen the map. Sweet at the tip, salty and sour on the sides, and bitter at the back. Turns out that was complete nonsense. This whole idea came from a mistranslation of a German paper from 1901. The original researcher was actually just measuring how sensitive different parts of the tongue were to tastes. But when his work got translated... Someone turned his subtle sensitivity differences into strict, exclusive taste zones. It's like someone took a weather report saying, it's slightly warmer in Texas, and turned it into, the only place that has heat is Texas. Go ahead, test it. Put some salt or sugar on the very back of your tongue. According to the old map, you shouldn't taste it there at all, but you can taste it just fine. The truth is, your entire tongue can taste all flavors. Every single one of your taste buds has receptors for sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. This one wrong idea was taught in schools for over 100 years. Millions of kids drew those silly tongue maps in their science notebooks, all because of one bad translation. Number 9. The Roman Vomitorium For years, people thought a vomitorium was a special puke room where rich Romans would go to throw up during massive feasts. The story went that they'd eat until they couldn't anymore, head to the vomitorium, empty their stomachs, and then then go back for round two. That is completely wrong. A vomitorium was actually just an exit in a stadium or amphitheater. The word comes from the Latin vomer, which means to spew forth. But it wasn't about people spewing. It was about crowds of people spewing out of a building. Think about a modern stadium after a big game. Everyone rushes out of the exits at once, like toothpaste being squeezed from a tube. That's what a vomitorium was designed for. The Romans were brilliant architects who figured out how to move massive crowds efficiently. These exits could empty a 50,000-person stadium like the Colosseum in just a few minutes. The myth probably started because ancient Romans did sometimes overeat, and some did occasionally make themselves throw up, but they didn't have special designated rooms for it. The myth just sounded so deliciously decadent that it got repeated in books, movies, and even some history classes. Number 8. Viking Horned Helmets Picture a Viking. You're probably picturing a giant bearded warrior wearing a helmet with two big horns sticking out of it, right? Turns out, that's about as historically accurate as thinking pirates walked around saying "r" all day. The whole horned helmet thing was basically made up for an opera in 1876. A costume designer wanted to make the Viking characters look more fierce and dramatic on stage, and the look just stuck. It's like if future historians thought we all dressed like Lady Gaga in her meat dress phase, because they found pictures of the VMAs. Real Vikings would have laughed at the idea of putting horns on their helmets. Imagine you're in the middle of a frantic battle, swinging your axe, and your horns get stuck in a tree branch or a doorway, or your buddy turns around too quickly and pokes your eye out. It's wildly impractical. Real Viking helmets were simple, practical steel or iron caps, designed for one thing, to keep your brain inside your head where it belongs. Archaeologists have dug up plenty of Viking-era weapons and armor, but not a single horned helmet. And far from being just dirty barbarians, Vikings had common complex trading networks, and surprisingly sophisticated grooming habits using combs, tweezers, and even ear cleaners. Number 7. The Great Tomato Panic Imagine being afraid of pizza, like genuinely terrified that a slice of margarita could kill you. For hundreds of years, many Europeans were convinced that tomatoes were deadly poison. And to be fair, they had some evidence. Rich people actually started dying after eating tomatoes, which made everyone go, See? I told you so. But it wasn't the tomatoes killing them. It was their fancy plates. Wealthy Europeans in the 1700s ate off pewter plates, which were high in lead. The natural acid in tomatoes would leach the lead out of the plates, giving these fancy folks a nice serving of lead poisoning with their salad. Meanwhile, poor people who ate off wooden plates were totally fine, but nobody paid attention to them. The paranoia got so bad that people started calling tomatoes poison apples. This fear lasted until the 1800s, when one brave guy named Colonel Robert Gibbon Johnson decided he'd had enough. In 1820, he stood on the steps of a courthouse in New Jersey and ate a whole basket of tomatoes in front of a crowd that had gathered to watch him die. When he was completely fine, the tide of public opinion finally started to turn. Number 6. The heart is for thinking. Imagine going to school and your teacher tells you that your brain is just useless stuffing and your heart is what does all your math homework. For thousands of years, that's exactly what some of the smartest civilizations believed. Ancient Egyptians, for example, thought the heart was the center of all intelligence, emotion, and memory. It was your body's personal computer. The brain? They thought it was just useless filler, 
like the packing peanuts you get in an Amazon box. When they mummified their pharaohs, they carefully preserved the heart because they thought you'd need it to think and pass judgment in the afterlife. The brain, on the other hand, they just yanked out through the nose with a hook and threw it away. It's like keeping the keyboard but tossing out the actual computer. Even Aristotle, one of the most brilliant minds of the ancient world, got it completely wrong. He thought the brain was just a radiator designed to cool down the hot blood pumped up from the heart. He believed the heart did all the heavy lifting, thinking, feeling, and making decisions. This idea is still hiding in our language. When we say, learn by heart, follow your heart, or describe someone as heartbroken, we're using relics of a time when we thought the heart was literally doing the thinking. Number 5. Animal Trials Imagine you're living in medieval France, and your neighbor's pig gets loose and eats a child. Today, it would be a horrific tragedy. Back then, it was a horrific tragedy followed by a court case for the pig. For centuries in Europe, animals were put on trial for crimes, just like humans. In 1386, a pig in France was arrested, given a lawyer, and put on trial for murder. The pig was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging. They even dressed it in human clothes for the execution. It wasn't just pigs. In 1474, a rooster in Switzerland was put on trial for the unnatural crime of laying an egg, which people believed was the work of Satan. The rooster was convicted of sorcery and burned at the stake, but sometimes the animals won. In 1750, a female donkey in France was acquitted of charges of bestiality after character witnesses, human witnesses, testified that she was a virtuous and well-behaved animal. The human involved was convicted, but the donkey walked free. These trials were run by both religious and secular courts, with full legal proceedings, lawyers, and judgments, all based on the belief that animals had moral agency and could be held responsible for their actions. Number 4. Phrenology Imagine going to a job interview, and instead of asking about your experience, Experience, the interviewer starts feeling the bumps on your head. In the 1800s, this was a legitimate practice thanks to phrenology, the science of reading a person's character and abilities from the shape of their skull. Phrenologists believed that the brain was made of different organs for different traits, and the size of these organs was reflected in bumps on your skull. They created these creepy head maps, dividing the skull into zones for everything from love of music to destructiveness. A bump in the wrong place meant you were probably a criminal. A flat spot where a bump should be meant you didn't have what it takes for a promotion. This wasn't some fringe belief. Companies hired phrenologists to vet job applicants. People chose marriage partners based on head bump compatibility. And most disturbingly, racists used it to prove that certain groups were inferior based on their skull shapes. It was junk science used to justify prejudice and bad decisions for decades. All because one guy in the late 1700s thought his classmate with bulging eyes had a good memory. Number 3. Bathing is dangerous. Imagine telling your friends, sorry, I can't shower, it might kill me, and having them nod in agreement. For centuries, especially from the Middle Ages to the 1700s, Europeans genuinely believed that bathing was incredibly dangerous. The logic went like this. Your skin has pores, right? Doctors thought that when you bathed, especially in hot water, these pores would swing wide open. And what comes through open doors? Uninvited guests. In this case, the unwanted visitors were diseases which they believed were carried in the air and would waltz right into your body through those open pores. It's like thinking your skin is a house with thousands of tiny doors and taking a bath is inviting all the ghosts in the neighborhood to come inside. This belief was so strong that some people went their entire lives without a proper bath. Queen Elizabeth I of England was considered a clean freak because she reportedly bathed once a month. Instead of washing, people would just change their linen underclothes, believing the fabric would magically absorb all the dirt and sweat. For hundreds of years, some of the wealthiest, most educated people in Europe walked around smelling like a gym locker that's been sealed shut for a decade. Number 2. Corpse Medicine Imagine walking into your local pharmacy with a headache, and instead of Tylenol, the pharmacist hands you a packet of ground-up human mummy. From the 1500s all the way to the early 1900s, this was considered premium health care in Europe. They called it corpse medicine, and it wasn't some weird back-alley thing. Kings, queens, and even popes were using remedies made from human remains. The most popular was powdered Egyptian mummy, which was thought to cure everything from headaches to the plague. The demand got so high that there weren't enough real mummies to go around, so a black market for fake mummies popped up, using the corpses of executed criminals and beggars. But it gets worse. Some people believed drinking fresh, warm blood from a recently executed criminal could cure epilepsy. Executioners would literally sell cups of blood right at the scaffold. You could also buy powdered human skull at the pharmacy to cure a migraine. The belief was that the life force or spirit of the deceased person was passed on to the patient. It was a bizarre, 
grisly, and widespread medical practice that lasted for centuries, all based on the idea that the secret to a long life was eating dead people. Number 1. The Four Humors and Bloodletting Imagine going to the doctor with a common cold, and instead of telling you to get some rest, they pull out a knife and say, time to drain some of your blood. For over 2,000 years, this was the cornerstone of Western medicine. The theory of the Four Humors, started by the ancient Greeks, stated that the human body was filled with four special liquids, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. Your health depended on these four juices being in perfect balance. If you were too angry, you obviously had too much yellow bile. Too sad? An excess of black bile. And if you had a fever, were too energetic, or basically had any ailment at all, the default diagnosis was that you had too much blood. Want to know the solution for almost everything? Bloodletting. Doctors would cut a vein and drain blood into a bowl. They even used leeches or cupping, where heated glass cups created suction on the skin to draw blood to the surface. This treatment killed countless people. George Washington, America's first president, famously died after contracting a throat infection. His doctor's response was to drain about half of his body's total blood volume in less than a day, which almost certainly sent him into hypovolemic shock and hastened his death. Doctors would see their patients getting weaker from blood loss and think, clearly we have not bled them enough. It was a deadly feedback loop that dominated medicine for millennia, making it the single most dangerous and wrong-headed belief in medical history. That's all for today. I'll be making similar videos in the future. Subscribe to see them.